Hey everybody, it's Natalie Alicia Gold with the Gold Standard and I'm here with a new friend of mine, Jonathan Cullen. Hey Jonathan. Hi Natalie, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on the show. So I have to admit, Jonathan is the darling of the legal world, especially on LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn women's group and when we saw Jonathan's video, not just us, the world, Everyone fell in love with Jonathan and wanted a piece of the action. And he was just so kind to be to say yes to my invitation to come on the show. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Very kind intro. Thank you. <laughs> so so uh, Jonathan is a vice president and general counsel of Pfizer Canada. He is a giving principle based legal advice in corporate healthcare for over 16 years. His true passions are developing people, leading teams, and he makes it a point to be out in the world as a special needs dad, which I really want to talk about. So, so Jonathan, tell us, in this pandemic and in these crazy times, what changes are happening on an institutional company level with you and Pfizer? Yeah, well, great question. I mean, for us, uh, as, a, as a company, our purpose really relates to patients. You know, our, our purpose as an organization uh, it is our breakthroughs that change patients' lives. So to work for a company like that now, during this period, you know, in a, in a type of pandemic that you may see only every hundred years, um, you know, I always wanted to work at an organization where I could have an impact on people, you know, individuals, and there's really never been a better time. I, I remember my first day on the management team in my current role and uh, sit down in the management meeting and we put up a slide of an individual patient who needed a specific drug. And the whole meeting was about, you know, how are we gonna think about getting this drug to this person? It wasn't approved yet, the, the, the physician needed it. So it's really at the individual person level, which is, you know, what I think really drives me. And now, you know, like you said, in this current situation, our entire organization has been, you know, extremely focused, extremely focused on essentially, you know, helping the world solve this problem. And so that's what we've been focused on. Uh, you know, we're, we're one of many companies and organizations and government entities working towards a solution. We'll see where we're, it's been, it's public, we're in the clinical trials now. And depending on when people, you know, see this, who knows where we will be. But we're extremely focused on that and i can say even in my capacity as you know part of the legal team all the all the people i know in the legal division around the world at pfizer are focused on this you know there's lots of uh you know things for the legal team regulatory team medical team we're all we're all sort of growing in one direction which is very gratifying you know as a person and as a, a, a as a lawyer and a professional and you sort of come home at the end of the day saying did i work on a priority today yeah, I did. <laughs> I would say that's a pri yeah. I mean, talk about change the world. We a lot of people mm -hmm. talk about it, but you guys are actually implementing day in day out with a hope to make the world a better place post pandemic, to make it a post pandemic world. Yeah, exactly. And the other part that you know isn't lost on a lot of people, it's you know even throughout this, people continue to need their medications. You know, for all sorts of illnesses. You know, vaccinations. You know, it's a it's a, a small part of it that you know parents who've been afraid or unable to get out and see their physician to get vaccinations for their children. Um, you know, people who need oncology medicine who are facing difficult diagnoses of cancer. That doesn't end. You know, that doesn't end because we we're in a lockdown or because services are slowed down. So the second part of it, you know, for us over the last six months has been. How can we continue to serve patients and, and government and institutions and hospitals that whose services were only more needed? You know, especially the uh, you know when we talk about um, patients who are ill and they have to go to the hospital with COVID or COVID-related diseases. There's a, um, a high demand at the hospitals for other drugs that we you know other medicines that Pfizer uh, puts in the market. So our focus is in a second way has been on that. Like, how do we keep how do we keep the machine rolling and patients safe? And sort of the third pillar for us has been our employees, you know, really an inward focus on uh, ensuring our employees have what they need to do the first two things. You know, if you 
you don't put your, you know, in the airplane commercial, you know, when you're on the plane, if you don't put your mask on before your, your partner or your kid, that, you know, you're, you're not going to be in good shape. So we're making sure that our employees are, are well taken care of, able to work from home, have what they need. Mental, physical health has been a huge focus for us. Small things, you know, when people were working at home with their kids, how can we make that a little bit easier? You know, we could talk about that, but like half my time was spent focused on just trying to lighten things up for people, doing some funny videos and posts on our internal social media about what it was like for me to work from home with two young kids. Uh, and because I knew that everybody was doing that too, and everyone was feeling sort of overwhelmed, you know, so we really thought about that third pillar of our employees as well. Which is beautiful. What I'm hearing coming out from you in everything that you're doing, both as a human being and as a company, is preserving that humanity and truly telling people we're here for you and we understand, whether it be your employees or the world at large. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. It's, um, it's very easy to look at healthcare and large systematic worldwide problems like this or many others in a cold and aggregate kind of way. And it really helps, I can just speak for me personally, it really helps when I boil it down to, you know, what does this mean for this person's grandmother or that person's son or my neighbor? Like how would this affect them? So to have a, a more personal way to looking at it really helps. And uh, you know, especially if it impacts your own family, if you have you know, someone in your family that's experienced something um, and you work in healthcare, it's all that more meaningful. You really have a, a passion to sort of, you know, do what you can. Sure. So Jonathan, for you, a lot of attorneys follow my page and I'm sure yours as well. So you are pretty high up there in the Pfizer organization on the legal side. How did you do it? A lot of people want to know about the in-house life, the in-house road. If you can shed some light on that. Yeah, sure. Well, Pfizer's a big organization, so that I'm not that high up. You may be surprised, but there's, there's, but I mean, I, I honestly would say a couple things. I mean, just that the, you know, I've always looked at my career as uh, looking at you would like you would look at a business plan. You know, and I, I think that'll speak to a lot of the people in the audience in terms of, especially in-house counsel who have to deal with their, you know, business putting a plan in front of them and how do I give advice based on that plan? And I think it's very applicable when you think about your own career. You know, there's no business plans that survive very short-term thinking. There's no business plans that survive not building in risks and opportunities. Long-term thinking, uh, you know, thinking innovatively, you know, uh, differentiating your business or your product against others. So all those things apply to a career, you know, if you, you can spend a lot of your focus on a million different things, or you can choose the things that really matter to you and match them up to a job that actually benefits from your strengths, you know, and if that doesn't line up, maybe that's a nice hint that maybe it's not the role for you or the company or the industry or, or sort of the team for you. So for me, it was, um, just doing what I liked, you know, like, uh, working at the beginning on, if I got onto a file or, or a particular matter um, and there was an aspect of it that I really thought I could advance that maybe we didn't think about and it interested in me, I just did it. You know, I just did it. And I think a lot of that being proactive and working on, um, you know, the aspects that you think will make a difference. Some of that sometimes takes a bit of courage because not everybody's going to believe in the part that you believe in. <laughs> and it does, it does take you to sort of say, no, I believe in it. I'm going to take a stab at this. Cur and courage is a very important word. And yeah. I've been a lot about it. It's, it's truly not fearlessness, which is kind of crazy. Some things you want to be fearful of, like you want to teach your kids. If a car is coming down the street, you know, d move. Yeah. Um, but it's when the right things and when you're feeling that stress and that fear and it's saying there's something more important than that and I'm going to take a stand. I think that's right. And it's hard to do that very early in your career because you feel like you want to take a stand on everything. You're not quite sure where to really focus. So I spent a long time at the beginning. I was, uh, I practiced intellectual property litigation at a, a law firm before I went in-house at Pfizer. And I, I learned from some very, very smart people 
And then when I started practicing in house, I really, one of the most important things to do, I think early on and even sort of mid career is identify models, you know, and mentors or, 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 or anti mentors, you know, people you look at and say, lovely person, but I don't want my career to be like that. We're you know, not a so lovely person, too. kind of an asshole. We're not so lovely. Yeah. So if it's <laughs> behaviors that you think, you know what? I, I, when I, when I'm going to be working with more people or managing people or being in a leadership position, I'm going to treat people differently from that. Those are very valuable lessons. So very. I think early, Sometimes early, we learn more in a job what not to do. Exactly. So early on, it was a lot of that. I think just observing without judgment, you know, watching, watching people to say, why are they doing that? Like, maybe I don't agree, but that mental exercise of watching something you don't understand and potentially disagree with at the beginning, and then landing at the end of a project on, ah, I see why that person approached it that way. That is very valuable because later that will, that exercise, now you know where you can take a stand to say, you know what, I do believe in this. And having done those nine things before, I know that I can sort of push on this one. What I also love is that you know, sometimes from, I haven't been an employee at a place since I was 24 years old. So I have been blazing my own path, but it was valuable to be an employee and to understand from the boss's perspective, which I don't think people do a great job of explaining mm -hmm. from management, why are we doing mm -hmm. this? And I think especially Jonathan, I would love your opinion on this. I've done a lot of research about generational differences of work styles between gen z millennials uh you know gen x etc so the question is are you finding that the newest people on your team the most recent graduates are working in a different way and are more successful when spoken to in a different way as opposed to the people who might have been there 20 or 30 years yeah, I think the answer is always going to be yes. You know, the people that come on board have had an experience in, you know, whether it's schooling or a recent job that is just generationally different than, and I'm sort of now feeling old in this conversation, but then, then when you did it, and that is a good thing. That is a good thing. It's, it's turnover of ideas that if we all have the same ideas over time, you know, in my business, if you don't evolve, you get out competed. You know, it, we work in a highly innovative, business that's layered into a highly regulated framework, meaning you got to be really innovative and really good at finding the right sort of pathway. So I really value, I, I value um, a lack of knowledge of what the status quo is. That's valuable to me because then the person comes in with no preconceived ideas. Maybe they'll say six things that don't make sense, but the seventh thing will be genius because they didn't have those assumptions that held me back. So Yes, I think that's valuable. And you also said something that I think is important is, it's really important at all levels in your career, in my opinion, to understand your boss or your manager's perspective as much as you can. And you know, I, I remember doing in um, some management courses back in the day, just, you know, I remember particularly an article reading how to, how to manage your boss. And you know, that, that, that title caught my, caught my eye. And it was a lot about, you know, you you'd be surprised at how little your manager understands what you're doing. Help them, you know, help them understand what you believe is Thank important. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. And it, it, you know, I, it's, it's interesting to listen to two people speak and it's them and their manager. And they're saying something that I know is too detailed and is going over the manager's head because that person is dealing at a perspective that's just different. So it, it works really well when, let's just say you've got three people at three layers in the organization. Each one is sort of nailing it at their own perspective, like doing really well at the, their perspective. And then each of them connect the three perspectives together. That's when it hums, you know? But when each of them assumes the other person knows what they're doing, that's when it misses, you know? So spending some time trying to understand what your manager's goals are what are they trying to achieve what are their challenges budget constraints why did they make that decision that you don't agree with maybe there's something you're missing and it's often that there's something you're missing and you just didn't ask you know a hundred percent and you know I, I i think 
what gets lost a lot, I mean, and, and maybe you can guide me and our viewers on being better at this, is when you're leading an organization, it's taking the time to explain it slowly in a way that makes sense and step by step. And also being like at the thousand, you know, 10,000 foot view of you're going so fast, things are changing. And almost an expectation of your people to say like, can you give me more details on that? Or I think you're talking about X, Y, and Z. So how have you seen it actually be successful? Right. One of the benefits of working for an organization of the breadth of, of Pfizer or many others, I get to work with experts in communications. That to me is great. Like, and also experts in advertising, experts in, you know, how do you reach other people? And I have learned from that tremendously. You know, I think one thing lawyers could do immediately that would skyrocket their success is to stop thinking they're the smartest person in the room all the time. Oh, yes. We, we Wait, really, thank you. We, we frequently are not. And that is fantastic. If your clients are high functioning, really good at what they do, can connect even with your legal issues, that's awesome. Like, why wouldn't you want that? So I work with people like that. I work with people who are experts in their domain and start to be semi-experts in my domain. So that's, you know, that's very um, rewarding, challenging. So at the, to your question, you know, when, you know, the, for example, the communication, you know, mantra, people don't get your message the first time. You need to repeat it. You need to repeat it in a way that's not annoying and repeat it in a way that's digestible and adds a new angle and an insight. So I've seen so many ideas, campaigns, whatever, fail. Really good, broad ideas that people spend a long time on fail because they just thought that I will say it once and it's so good that of course they'll get it and they'll buy in. And if, if I've ever had a good idea, it's, it's sometimes taken years to really gain hold. And I think part of it is have patience, you know, to go back to the courage discussion, have patience that the first time you present your idea, it's very new. People are not going to like jump up and down, first of all, because they probably didn't even understand how new it was and, and how, you know, you're in the trenches. This is your baby. Yeah. You're baby. People, it's yeah, like, yeah. it's another ad, yeah. it's another thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a big fan life. of, uh, right. I'm a big fan of planting seeds. You know, you, you plant a seed of an idea. You let it grow, you come back to it in a different context. That's really important. Like you plant a seed here, and then when you're in a different context, you say, remember that discussion we had, this is where I think it adds value. You plant another seed with another person, and all of a sudden the network of people who are behind your idea is bigger. You know, there's, there, that's the sort of patient, long-term, like I said, have your business, business plan as a career, and even just to do the right thing you know, as a lawyer, um trying to ram ideas down the throats of really smart people you know who have lots on their plate already never works yeah, yeah you're so right and you know i actually read this morning an article that gary vaynerchuk put out and i'm a big gary v fan i don't know if you are as well definitely follow him and if we weren't we would not anyway put it out there in the world but i actually really do love gary v so here, here's the deal. He said, you know, sometimes when an advertiser comes in and builds a strategy for a brand, it could take a year to execute. The world has changed in a year. I mean, six months ago, we weren't in the same world as we are now. And it, it could not land yeah. so well. To your point, it could be kind of miss the mark. So I think to his point was constant iteration and putting out more micro on a more significant yeah. or you know regular basis what do you think about that yeah I, i'm a big fan of you know come up with an idea and then don't you know be be bold and pushy about the cleanly flexible in where it can apply and the value of that is you know you can really come up with tons of different applications to your ideas, which makes it more valuable. If you have one app, narrow application to your idea, to your, if you even just boil it down to legal advice, and you, know, you, you mentioned in the intro, my approach is principle-based advice. Giving a principle as a piece of legal advice 
is that. It lays out an idea that has many different uses that can be applied by your client, not even by you, by your client in tons of different you know, uh, situations. If you give a narrow idea, maybe it's useful today, maybe it's not useful seven minutes from now. So you, you having flexibility and looking forward to say, will this idea or piece of advice still be applicable in a year, two, five years? What would change? What would make it not applicable? That's the kind of thinking, you know, to go back to your question about people who join the organization, maybe they're fresh out of school, they, they're good at the idea generation, but when I pressure test, will that idea crack under different contexts? It's often the case, which is fine. Like, that's how you start thinking about ideas, you know? It's so interesting because I don't want to guess at what your age is. But my guess is that you are around my husband's age. And you know, we have a 10 year age. So I'm 31. I'll say how old I'm. He's in his early 40s. He's, he's, four, he's 41 years old. Are you, am I about right? Yes, I'm 43. Okay. So that generation close, of 40. people in their young 40s okay. is a very different um, thinking, even than so called millennial generation that I'm in. And my husband will often say, I'm not against you just because I'm giving you the devil advocate's perspective. I want to make you better and we're on the same team. And I go, how dare you not think my idea is been awesome? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, today I think the approach is if somebody has an idea that is different from yours and is a little bit uh, prickly about it, we'll just block them. You know, if we're talking about an online discussion or, or you know, the, the value of advocate is enormous. It is enormous. And you, you must be able, especially as a lawyer, to see, you know, why something will fail. Why will this not work? That's, that's a question, it's an idea. Great, I see the upside, thought about some of the risks, seems like it's good for patients, you know, it seems like it's good for the organization. What would make this fail? You know, and if they don't know, if they haven't thought about that, you're gonna force me to be the devil's advocate. I, I always like when like a client will come to me with, I, I already know there's upsides. I assume there's upsides. If you're coming to me with an idea, there are upsides. You almost don't even have to mention them. You have to get into, I've thought about the risks. And you know, my highest value clients are the ones that have yeah, perfectly fine. I'm glad they don't. Like all the legal framework or all the regulatory framework or whatever. But they've thought, hmm, why might this fail? Where where could the sticking points be? And to have that devil's advocate mentality, that's big, that's a really good tenth one. If you don't weed out ideas, you're you're stuck with too many of them. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's brilliant. And it really, truly is so important for people to understand the generational differences because even doing generational work and, and I, educating myself about it, I was able to see in my own marriage, in my own life, how people are coming to it from a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the one thing I did, you just to connect it to my comment about finding mentors, um, I, I value having mentors even right now at different stages, you know, of their careers. And some of the best mentors I have are of a very different, you know, time frame in their career. They're either just retired, about to retire. They've sort of seen where I'm going to be going in the next 20 years. And also the people who are, uh, you know, all the way down the line in that age group, I get different perspectives from different experiences. So I think it's really valuable to have conversations and, and mentorship and just for friends and colleagues of a diverse gamut of experiences, you know, generations. Like I, it's always interesting, you know, I, when I sit in a meeting and I see I'm sitting in a group of diverse people uh, along many, you know, many measurements, you know, whether it be backgrounds, experience, age, you're going to get a better decision out of that because each person's coming at it with a you know very different perspective. So the generational differences are super valuable, I find. Tell me a little bit about the 
woman man dynamic at a big company like Pfizer or your experiences? Yeah, I mean, I, a little bit for me is the entire time I've had this role, um, just m all of the people that have worked on my teams have all been women, which is, you know, interesting for me in a, in a very good way. Uh, I, went, I remember when I went to law school, as I was leaving, it was a pretty big um, female to male ratio. Like it was just, the, especially in the legal profession, it was starting that way. So, you know, uh, that's an important uh, aspect for diversity for Pfizer, among others. I can speak to specifically, I've been privileged to be uh, in the past, and I've, I've passed that baton to someone else, but privileged to be one of the executive sponsors of our uh, women's network in, at Pfizer Canada. Well, number one, you know, gender diversity is a business advantage. Number two, right thing to do. Number three, I'm a dad of a daughter. Like I'm, I'm just sort of thinking ahead. You know, I would want people setting my daughter up for success, uh, and I really value that because, again, to go back to our discussion on perspectives, I don't have the perspective of a woman. So that's super valuable for me to, you know, try to understand what are the challenges that someone has that doesn't have my background or perspective. That can only make me better. Of a, even a small team, you really need to dig into, you know, what are people's challenges at home? You know, there's a fine balance to be sort of digging around in that, but you need to be able to be open to that. So not understanding the perspective that people have, you're never going to be fully immersed in it, but being open to things you don't understand. And, you know, the other, the other half of diversity, of course, is inclusion, you know, like to have if you've got the right people around the table, but you're not allowing the conversation to be open to a diverse group of opinions, you're going to lose it. It was completely wasted to create the diverse group. You know, it might be a good experience on the one hand, but you're losing the input from people with different perspectives. So that's, you know, even today before our call, uh, we had a, a town hall, all the employees in Canada dial in to, you know, a, a video call and the first or second topic we had was an update from our, our diversity and inclusion team. It's a very critical part of the organization for Pfizer. It's beautiful. And Jonathan, speaking about your kids and your daughter who, and son, who we've spoken a little bit about offline, off yeah. here. well, really online, everything is online today, right? This is as close to face to face as we can get, but, and uh, tell me a little bit about your experience as a father as a father to, to a child with special needs. And tell me what that's been like for you. Yeah, 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 thank you. Nice topic for me. Um, so my daughter, Olivia, is 10. She turned 10 during the COVID period, which was interesting. And my son, Tristan's eight. And as you mentioned, Tristan has uh, special needs. He has Down syndrome. Um, so that's, you know, that has added uh, a layer to my life and my wife's life that we didn't anticipate. Uh, that has been extremely challenging, but extremely rewarding. Um, and it's really changed the way that I've looked at the world. You know, er everybody, um, you know, these days sort of compares, spends a lot of time comparing their kid to other kids and, you know, with grades, uh, baseball, uh, what they're wearing, you know, uh, how good they are at this, how good they are at that. And I, I, I can't do that. I can't compare compare him to other regular kids. So I compare him to him, which is a huge life lesson. You know, his milestones and his advancement and his development. I don't look at what the kid down the street is doing. I don't even look at what my daughter's doing. So now I forget what the normal timelines for. I forget when she did stuff because I'm more focused on him comparing to himself. And that is a difficult thing to learn, you know, and I apply that to uh, other aspects in my life, you know, it's like we're so focused on uh, comparing our progress and what we have in life to, to what we don't have and to what others have. When really, you know, I think I think what I've learned a lot from Tristan is uh, to compare, you know, where he was last year, where he was a year ago, and his progress is always micro progress. You know, he's like like most kids with Down syndrome, he has a global developmental delay. So everything he does is later and more difficult to get to. 
And uh, there's a lot of lessons in that. You know, I, I don't have a lot of aha moments where magically he wakes up and something's, you know, has changed and he's, he's good at what he's doing now. It's very, very micro progress over time and it layers and you need a lot of support. We have a lot of, uh, you know, he does a lot of different types of therapies and support and he goes to a special needs school. So all those things are all different. They're a bit heavier of a layer. Uh, but it really, you know, when he was when he was born, he was extremely sick. He was in the hospital for for four months. Uh, he had chemotherapy, heart surgery, uh, all sorts of other surgeries. There's a lot of health issues that can come with Down syndrome at the beginning of life, and he pretty much had them all. And that was uh, a reflection point for me in many ways in my career. Uh, I, I I was off work for six months, so I didn't work for six months, which you know, I, I tell I tell my colleagues at, at work now, um, and I've told our global general counsel, you know, the reason I'm at Pfizer, period. You know, I was told by my boss at the time, don't worry about work, take care of your family, period. You know, make, make sure you're okay. And I was able to focus on being at the hospital with him. So that gave me a lot of time to reflect being at a hospital bed 12 hours a day, you know, with your child that we, we really thought he was going to die for several months. And I thought a lot about it, lots of things. So when you come out of that, very hard to be, you know, I have my, I definitely have my bad days. If my wife was here, she'd be correcting me, but I have my bad days, but very hard to be like cynical about stuff. You know, like I, I, you sort of, when you see the bottom and other people help raise you out of that, there's a lot, a lot to give now, you know, and uh, it takes a lot of, uh, it takes a lot of energy to be a special needs parent. It's um, like any parent, and I know you know this, is like patience is a big, you know, a big valuable thing. You really need even more patience with special needs children and you need to be advocates for them. Like the world is not designed for them. Um, and you, so you need to find the niches for them and be advocates for them. But it's made me, I think, a better lawyer. Honestly, like my, the approach I take at work is different now that I've had kids like everybody. But in particular, having faced those challenges, you know, I sort of see the world a little bit differently. It's, it's a beautiful thing because you truly were able to incorporate the beauty in life through this experience. And what a wonderful father, what a wonderful role model, not just for your own family, but for the world you are. And I, I am just so proud of you for who you are and that shining of the light because it's, it's not easy to get real with ourselves and to get real with what's really going on in our lives. So thank you for that. Thank you. And it reminds me, you know, everybody, especially during this period where we've been all home, everybody has something going on in your life that your boss or your colleague doesn't know about. And that's difficult. Everybody. And, you know, when people are struggling at work or, you know, the work product may suffer or you're, you're seeing something off with them. You know, a lot of times with this sort of fast paced corporate environment, you want to jump to, okay, you know, what's wrong with the performance and you sort of focus on that. You know, it goes back to our conversation about just getting to know people at the human level. It, it's the right thing to do and I wouldn't do it any other way, but it, it's, also, it's, it's a business advantage. If you understand what someone's normal human patterns are and something is different, you can you then you got to ask questions as a manager like are you okay and beyond you know are you okay yes and move on you know really to dig in what's going on and how can i help this person how can, how can i create an environment that they feel they can trust me to come to me to talk that's super important so you know i i think about the days that's not going well for me at home with the kids and there are plenty of those I'm sure it shows a little bit. <laughs> so I'm sure for other people, it shows too. And it's okay to give people space with that and just create that environment that they can come and talk to you, you know? I love it. And Jonathan, if we, you know, if you could take, so I, I as you know, do wills and trust planning yeah. and asset protection for people. But really what I do is I get down to the essence of who are they as a human being Mm -hmm. And what is their legacy? What do they want to be remembered by? Mm -hmm. So if I could ask you, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, mm -hmm. what is the legacy you want to leave on this earth? Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think maybe I would, I'll start with how I approach 
my jobs, like if I look at the single job you're in and then then I'll answer your question. My legacy I would want for a particular job I'm in is to leave it different and better than when I started. So that when the next person takes over, it's not the same job anymore and they reinvent it and they reinvent it and they reinvent it. So for me, at the most core level, I think for the people that I love and care about in my family and you know the people that I, I really value in my professional life, I would want to leave their lives different and better having known me. And that'll be different for everybody. You know, that'll be different. For my kids, it'll be a very particular thing. And for the people I work with, it'll be something completely different, you know, and you can achieve that by being the same person, but in different contexts, you know, that's why I believe I, there's a lot of people and it's not through maliciousness or there are, you know, something negative. They're not the same person at work or, you know, and at home and they sort of flip a switch. I, I just, I'm not able to do that. I, I really believe in, you know, and I think it was something that I posted on LinkedIn because that's how we sort of start chatting in, in like a parental advantage and a parenting advantage where, you know, you bring everything you learn as a parent to work because there's so many lessons as a parent and it's a complete waste to take all of the lessons that you're getting at work and not bring them home and start to say, you know what, I've learned how to do this and do that. How do I take that transferable skill and do it at home. So you can only do that if you're really your same authentic self at work and at home. And in that way, to answer your question, I would just want people to think my life is different and better having known him. Beautiful. Well, I know that for everyone who heard this, we just got an uplift in our life. So thank you so much for that, Jonathan. It's been a true pleasure. And I wish you all the best. I can't wait to continue to see you making the lives of everyone you touch better. Great. Thanks, Stanley. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.